this morning's docket. Case number 108825, Rulin v. Elliott. Council may proceed. May it please the court, I'd like to reserve two minutes of my time for rebuttal. Two minutes is granted. I'm William R. Thompson. I represent Suzanne Elliott. Suzanne Elliott is the daughter of Keith Elliott. She claims through intestate succession <clears throat> it is her position that Keith Elliott was the rightful owner of the land through adverse possession. The dispute here is a confusing one, and very quickly, it involves a 5.5 acre parcel of land in Cloud County. A couple of those acres are tillable land and used for farming. There's a dwelling or a storage shed that exists on the land. Uh, Keith Elliott was deceased. He died in 2009, before trial. His second wife, who would be on the other side that disputes ownership, would be Sue Elliott, originally Sue Moore, she passed away after trial, I believe, in 2013. Uh, the dispute now, the parties that are still with us, are Suzanne Elliott, daughter of Keith, and Polly Ruland, the daughter of Sue. Confusion over this land began in 1993. A, a deed was given by Keith and Sue to Sue's daughter, Polly Ruland. Uh, the circumstances are confusing, and they're in the briefs. More confusion occurred when Sue Elliott left. Later on, there was a divorce. Then uh, after Keith died, the children mostly disputed ownership of the land. The district court agreed with Suzanne Elliott in that her father achieved adverse possession through his 16 years of living on the land and acting as the owner in all ways after that original deed was given in 1993. In other words, the district court agreed that adverse possession did take place. The Court of Appeals disagreed and said, no, there was no adverse possession. Mr. Elliott, or Mr. Elliott did not have the required state of mind for knowingly adverse possession, and we think he did. The Court of Appeals said that there is a take rule. You, could I take you back? The 1993 deed was from Keith and his wife, Sue, to Polly and her husband, Eric. Correct. And it purported to be a warranty deed. Yes with no uh, restrictions or exceptions? The deed had no restrictions. Okay. And I understand there has been some allegations in here or some representations that the purpose for the deed was a temporary transfer to avoid uh, creditors, specifically the ex-wife and IRS. Is that correct? After Keith passed away, a letter was found in the dwelling, setting out that set of circumstances. And was that presented to the trial court? Yes, in detail. Okay. Did anyone bring up uh, KSA 33102? About because fraud? Fraudulent transfer. Fraudulent transfer, yes, that was part of an extensive org uh, argument before the court in pretrial motions, and the court did not agree that that was a fraudulent transfer as between uh, Keith and Sue and Polly and Eric, is that correct? I mean, you did not have an issue of a third party, an innocent third party, or even a creditor coming in. So, no. so, was her, was, so her ruling was that it wasn't fraud between the two parties of the deed, or was it something different than that? Well, you are correct, there was no third party, nobody actually got defrauded by the result of this. In fact, I, I don't know why they thought they needed to protect the property anyway, but uh, I believe the, the ruling of the district court was that uh, that fraudulent uh, concept did not operate between uh, the two parties that actually exchanged the deed. And the Freeman court discusses that as well, don't they, in their opinion, and kind of come to the same, re re same result? Well, not only that, the Freeman court sets out a set of 
factual circumstances that are almost identical to what took place here. Down the line, similarities are the exact same thing, including this fraudulent deed to a daughter who wouldn't give it back, and that's how the dispute started. Um, it's hard to speculate that there could be a case that could be less on point. Well, uh, the Court of Appeals, which overturned the uh, district court, did rely on the case from 1911, Dotson versus Railway, that sets out a rather easy rule. If a grantor gives a deed to somebody else and, and then remains on the property, his remaining there is uh, presumed to be temporary. Uh, it's with permission, his estate would be servient to that of the grantee. Uh, definitely, Keith Elliott and Sue Elliott were grantors, and definitely Keith re uh, remained there. Now, that rule is mentioned many times, but not always the uh, phrase that goes before that rule, absent any contrary evidence. Well, there's lots of contrary evidence here. Most significantly, Keith clearly wasn't there temporarily. He lived there for 50 years, and then 16 years after 1993 when he sent the deed. And we have a quick claim deed back. We do. Which, why isn't that a, an indication that uh, they were permitting him to live there, that it wasn't an adverse or hostile situation? Like the letter that was found explaining the situation, the quit claim deed was found in the paperwork after Keith passed away. There was no evidence if both Key and Keith and Sue were aware of it. There was no evidence that one of the married couple was aware of this deed. The deed was never filed. It was suspiciously given to Sue Elliott, but Keith's name was left off. It was the only act that Polly Ruland ever performed within the 16 year time that would be an indication that she considered herself to be an owner. She, she explained it by saying, well, I didn't consider myself to be an owner. I thought the land was always Keith's. The only reason I did this was I was getting divorced from my husband, Eric. The divorce negotiations were tiresome. I wanted to get it over with. My attorneys told me to sign this deed just to get it out of the, the uh, property that needed to be divided. Polly Ruland did sign that deed. Her signature on the piece of paper was her only and her single act indicating that she had anything to do with owning that land. Nothing else. The trial court, did the trial court at any stage make any rulings about the validity of that deed or the effect of that deed? Well, as the deed was never filed and there was no proof of actual delivery, I don't think the trial court ever did make any rulings on that Proof issue. of actual delivery to sue? A deed was found in papers. Actually, Sue, years later, said, well, Keith found that deed and he kept, she kept it from me. He kept it from me. There were accusations back and forth. No one knows. Um, but does that become important on exclusivity? If, it, if Sue became an owner upon the transfer of that deed, with that deed, does that affect exclusivity? Well, without filing and without proper delivery, we don't think Sue did become an owner because I don't think the deed was effective. But are those questions a fact that have to be determined? Possibly, because the court, well, the Court of Appeals never reached the exclusivity uh, issue. By the way, uh, there are numerous cases, and many of them cited in the briefs here, where spouses achieved adverse possession and the fact that you're married to a man or a woman didn't have anything to do with ruining your exclusivity. As against a third party. Or, but, but what about if the owner is one of the spouses? The owner... If, if, if that deed was effective and Sue became an owner, how does that ex affect exclusivity? 
Well, then Sue and Keith both would be owners of this land starting at the point that that deed. Uh, because of his spousal interest? Is that because of his spousal interest, and everything would go a different direction, direction there if that was the case. I don't think the district court ever went down that road, right, though. And do we need to, to determine exclusivity, do you think? No, I, I think that the exclusivity provision applies to when there's a competing interest as far as actual ownership of uh, the parcel of land that's in dispute. Family members, brothers and sisters, oftentimes achieve adverse possession and naturally spouses do too. And there's no question of the exclusivity problem in that case. In the time I have remaining, I would like to emphasize that the exception granted or carved out in Freeman versus Funk was only one year after the Dotson versus Railway case. It's a pretty strong presumption that the court knew exactly what it was doing and that it didn't intend this grantor rule to stop a person from achieving adverse possession in circumstances where they remained not temporarily but permanently and acted in all ways as the owner. Uh, finally, we've also made an argument that the real rule that should be applied here is the rule of acquiescence. From more than a hundred years ago, the Kansas courts have always recognized that when a landowner, a legal title holder, acquiesces to somebody else operating as the owner, they are abandoning the right. The definition of acquiescence is something that is inferred. Inferred permission, well, that's what we think acquiescence is, inferred permission. And acquiescence... But, but we don't, we don't, uh... We don't forfeit an ownership in real estate through silence or uh, 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 by accident unless you fit into the uh, adverse possession elements. And you're trying to, to change adverse possession to some other form of acquiescence? Is that what you're trying to argue? Or? No, I agree with the statement that we don't determine real estate ownership by accident because acquiescence is not an accident. It's an intentional decision to ignore something. It's ignoring something you have and letting somebody else have it. When the cases come to court, it's because the situation changed and well, I don't mind if somebody else owns my land, lives there, makes money from it until somehow Quite frankly, easy money comes from the case. The land's going to be condemned. Oh, wait a minute, that's mine. And there are cases and cited. In and case. if you're the record owner and the other party hasn't met the elements of adverse possession, why can't you make that claim? Well, you can make the claim, but does the court ever go against acquiescence? The same sentence is put what, in... What case do you have that would say that someone loses their record ownership in real estate uh, by acquiescence where adverse possession d did not accrue? Where the elements of adverse possession, say, that, say the acquiescence was 14 years, 11 months instead of 15 years. Okay. Do you have a case where that's occurred? The, the courts say it's adverse possession, but if... You compare the fact pattern and the, and the uh, motivational factors to the court, they're all acquiescence cases. In fact, even the Dotson case that gave this grantor rule, that was an acquiescence case. The court didn't grant adverse possession, but they ended up giving the party that was claiming adverse possession ownership of the land based on something called the public use doctrine and the fact that the true legal title owner didn't do anything, ignored it. The same case that's given as authority for the grantor rule, that was an acquiescence case. The terminology is different, but they're all acquiescence cases. 
any time a legal title owner, original owner, does something to assert dominion over the land, they win. There's no acquiescence. And it comes down to this case, what did Polly Rulin do to assert her dominion, her title? Absolutely nothing except sign her name in her divorce when her lawyer told her to. It's not enough. Even writing a letter to tell somebody to get off your land is not enough to counter that. See, my time is, is used up here, and I would like to still have that opportunity for two more minutes. Do we have any further questions? Thank you, Council. Please, the court. I'm Don Noah. Mr. Sperney and I'd like to split our 15 minutes. How do you propose to split that, Council? How much time are you asking for? Eight minutes. Eight. Very well. He'll, have, he'll finish. First of all, let me answer some questions. The, uh, the letter that's talked about here was written by Sue Elliott. There's no evidence in the record it was ever mailed. The uh, fact about the uh, deed being in front of creditors, there's two things wrong with that. The first is that Suzanne was not a creditor, and the other is that there's no showing that Keith and Sue were insolvent. The Dotson case says that if they're presumed to be permissive use where the grantor stays on. Permissive use can never ripen into adverse possession. But that, also, is, but that is a presumption that arises if there is not a, evidence to the contrary. Yes. And don't we have evidence to the contrary if the deed was passed to, to Polly and Eric with the understanding that this is a record transaction only, you are not get, being given any of the true rights of, uh, of the bundle of ownership? That, that letter was never mailed. There was never any... Well, despite the letter, don't we have Polly's understanding that that was the deal? No. Why not? Well, that letter was written by Sue in Glasgow, Kansas, and never went anywhere. There is no question that if Keith... Elliot had asked for it back, he would have gotten it. But we have, but don't Polly we have Polly's statement uh, that she and Eric didn't consider the property theirs in the divorce, and that's they why they were just They considered that they were holding the legal title. And her, but, but when did, this they, came, did they think they had the right to go out and sell that to anybody besides Keith or Sue? No, no, they held the legal title. When this case was filed, Sue, or Polly, was the record owner with her husband. After the case was fi filed, we got Eric out of the lawsuit by him giving a quit claim deed to Sue. So if you're gonna go by these deeds, Sue Elliott owns the property. Polly Rulin is still on the uh, record title. How, how do you get, uh, sir, how do you get that? Did, are you saying the quick claim deed only transferred Eric's interest? Yes. Well, just a minute, Justice. There's two, two quick claim deeds. The quick claim deed from both Polly and Eric went to Keith and it was never recorded. When we filed this lawsuit, we thought it was lost or destroyed. So the, the, the district court did not do anything with that deed. We were, after the case was filed, Polly and Eric were divorced and we found Eric in St. Joe, Missouri is my memory, and we got him out of the lawsuit by him 
giving uh, a, another quick claim deed to sue. So the record title now stands in Polly and Sue. Now, make and you're saying you're saying that the failure to record the deed uh, uh, destroyed it or I, made it ineffective to transfer Polly's interest. I think it wasn't delivered. The but, deed, but it was found they, in Keith's possessions. It found in Keith's possession after his death, unrecorded, and. What does recorded have to do with anything as between Keith and Polly? If Polly gives Keith a quick claim deed, whether he's, does he have to record it to make it effective? I, I don't think so, but you're mistaking that the deed was to Keith. It was to Sue. Okay. Keith did not get a deed, ever. Then, let's... So you're saying you're saying that the deed was never delivered to Sue, the grantee. Correct. Okay. But do we have a finding of fact of that from the judge? I think so. I, I've got them here. Uh, there's we thirty can some of them. We can look. And uh, let's go back a little bit now, and I'm gonna get, let Bernie go. Keith Elliott. The record is silent that Keith Elliott ever claimed title to this property after 1993. He had two opportunities. One was the divorce, and he did not claim it because he didn't own it. The other time was when he sold the rest of the 80 acres, and the judge finds there was a conversation, but she doesn't say what the conversation was, and that conversation was that uh, he didn't buy the the, the the neighbor Palmer that bought the 80, rest of the 80 acres, couldn't buy the uh, Elliott track because he didn't own it. They had an opportunity to claim it and didn't do it. Now, but on the other hand, didn't he sign a lease? Didn't he, didn't he lease part of the acreage out for agricultural use? And didn't he sign that as a, or negotiate, and, and I don't know if it was a written lease or an oral lease, uh, how that was done, but isn't he the one that leased, that, leased the, to this somebody? This is the rest of the 80. I understood there was a part of it that lapped over into the five acres. I well, thought I yeah, saw it. but the, they didn't, they, there's a little strip along the edge, and the farmer just farmed that too. See, but but did he have the right to do that if he was not the? I don't didn't know. understand himself to be the owner. I, I mean, know. isn't that what I'm saying? Isn't that an indicia that he understood he had control of the property? Well, he understood he was going to live there, and he did live there. But he didn't have the record title, and he didn't assert any title. He never claimed any title. Now let's talk about exclusivity. The record shows that they were married when they deeded the property. When they, there was a, a summary judgment of the clock and the, judge, the trial court found that there was, that they lived there when the clock was delivered to the farm in 96. And they find that Sue Elliott lived there until she went to Pittsburgh to get her father's house fixed up, which was in terrible shape, uh, in 2000. Now, there isn't any way that you can have exclusivity and 15 years. There's only, only nine years between 2000 and 2009 when he died. I thank you enough. Can you uh, tell me how you distinguish Freeman? Can you tell me how you distinguish Freeman? Yes. Freeman's a Mitchell County case. And, and Freeman, in the uh, opinion, the justice that wrote the opinion, 
differentiates, differentiates that. First, the uh, Morrow was the man. Freeman was just a guardian. Morrow was crazy in the booby hatch. And uh, Morrow claimed that he owned it all the time. The daughter admitted, admitted that she didn't uh, own it. And all she did was keep it because she didn't want him to get married again and get <clears throat> away. And she deeded back a life estate to him, and the guardian had to have the money, so he had to refile the lawsuit <clears throat> because they, he couldn't sell it with a life estate. In our brief, I, I set out the, what the court says about differentiating the case, and it sure didn't overrule Dotson. That answer your question, Dotson? Yes. Thank you. Any more questions of counsel? Thank you. Thank you. May it please the court, my name is Frank Sperney. I represent Sue Elliott, uh, and then she passed away on July 6, 2013. I'm the administrator of her estate in Cloud County. The presentation I intend to give to you is the adverse possession question. We all know that KSA 60-503 provides that no action shall be maintained against any person for the recovery of real property who has been in open, exclusive, and continuous possession of said real property. It talks about 15 years. In this particular case, gentlemen and ladies, Sue and Keith were married in 1988. They conveyed this property to Polly, has been pointed out, in 1993. And 2000, my lady Sue went to Pittsburgh, Kansas to handle some family affairs. So Keith Elliott only lived in this property exclusively from 2000 to 2009. There's no 15 years anywhere. And we would submit that Shaw versus Bandle, 122 Kansas, at page 343, when two parties jointly owned real estate and jointly occupied harmoniously, one of them cannot claim adverse possession against the other. Now, so while Keith and Sue were together, that's not adverse possession. They lived there together harmoniously. Then, uh, neither one had exclusive possession. Sir, let me clarify. You represent the estate of Sue Elliott. Sue Elliott, yes. Keith, Keith's uh, uh, was second ex-wife. Ex yes, yes. And, uh, are you claiming on behalf of her estate that the estate owns this property? Yes, Your Honor. Now. And, and by virtue of the quick claim deed? By virtue of the deed from, to her in her favor, yes. In, in 99. Yes, she owns half an interest in it and, Sue, and Polly owns the other half. But that, Clarify for me, is that the second quick claim deed that well, we heard about? Well, see, what's interesting here, too, Judge, is that this deed was mailed back to Keith, and he knew that the property other was deeded to Sue, but he never told her about it. She was not aware of this deed. Is that the quick claim deed under which you're asserting that your client no, has no, a... No, she, she had interest in it before. Okay, just tell me how Sue obtained her ownership. The deeds... Which deeds? Let's see, weren't there two deeds? The deed from Eric. The deed from Eric, the, the ex-husband the ex of Polly. But that was the, my understanding is that was the last in time deed. Is that yeah, correct? That was, or yeah, that was, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, that occurred well after, after Sue and after Keith after were Polly divorced. After Sue got divorced, Eric deeded the, his interest Which to was Sue. also after, after Sue went to Pittsburgh in 2000. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the, and, and you're saying that Eric had an interest to transfer at that time, well, notwithstanding he had executed a quick claim deed to abandon all in, uh, interest because that deed was not effective uh, for lack of delivery. Because Eric signed a deed, says I give up all my interest to Sue yes. in 99. Yes. And you're saying that that was not effective? No, I'm saying that's effective. That's a good conveyance. The first quick claim deed during the divorce, mm -hmm. 
You're saying that's effective. Well, he. The quick thing is the council. I'm, I'm a little confused, sir. Uh, this property. I think there is a deed in favor of Sue that was recorded. She got a half interest from Eric. Okay. Okay. But see, well, there's another deed I thought where they conveyed the property back to Sue, but Keith never recorded it, but that's still an effective conveyance. But we submit that there is no open, exclusive, and continuous possession by Keith Elliott at, to satisfy KSA 60-503. Uh, now, they acknowledge in their brief that a party seeking title by adverse possession must present clear and convincing evidence of the requisite statutory elements. And they cited Crone versus Nuss, 46 Kansas 2nd, 436. And they simply do not have adverse possession, folks. And uh, I do not understand what their theory is. There's no 15 years. Because here again, Sue and Keith lived in this property together from their 1993, or when they married 1988, to 2000. So there's no adverse possession by Keith at any time until she left the property, and she left her personal property there. We're still trying to find the grandfather's clock. <laughs> you never read about that. But uh, uh, there is no adverse possession by Keith Elliott in this case. He did live there alone from, two, from 2000 to 2009 until he died. Where's the 15 years? Now, they don't address that. Uh, the, the Court of Appeals pr previously held that there was no adverse uh, ownership or claim by the parties. They did not address the 15-year matter. We're addressing both issues. There's no adverse possession. There's no 15 years. Well, counsel, as I understand your argument, and you may help clarify it, I yes. hope I can. <laughs> your argument is that your client, Sue, obtained an ownership interest in this property. Yes. And in your earlier answer to my question, that ownership interest, according to your argument, was obtained after the year 2000. When Eric, in a second quick claim deed, quick claimed his one half interest to Sue. The first he was Counsel? There was, if, if, I'm I'm confused confused counsel? Counsel, I'm sorry. If there's a factual question that you don't have the answer to, okay, I'm sorry. Ask me if you would for permission to consult with okay. Mr. Noah uh, just a second uh -huh. to help you with the fact. Okay. But he is not to be helping you with legal arguments. Okay. Is that understood? Yes. May I okay. ask him a question on you, that? If you have a factual question, yes. Wasn't there a deed to sue before the? Eric needed his half his interest after our lawsuit was filed. Okay, so then help me understand how you're arguing that there's only nine years, not fifteen years, because That's right. Sue lived with Keith for a period of time up until two thousand. Yes. But based on your factual clarification just now, I take it you would concede that while Sue was living with Keith, she did not have an ownership interest in the property. Well they Is both lived there together. And the property was vested at that time in, in Pauly. Okay, so she did not have an ownership interest at that time, a deed, a, a deed interest, deed right, ownership deed. interest. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Right. Do we have any further questions of counsel? I'm sorry for my mix up. Oh, that's fine. Thank you for. Right. Thank you, counsel. You reserve two minutes for rebuttal. Keith Elliott was deceased, he died before trial. There's no real evidence before the district court of anything that Keith Elliott thought or what his state of mind was. There's only speculation. You might think his wife might know what he was thinking. At the end of Sue Elliott's telephone deposition, which was somewhat frustrating, she blurted out, this case is not about my dementia. Well, it wasn't until she said that Sue Elliott, I don't know what she thought. She quite often changed her mind. And we don't, we have no real evidence what Keith Elliott thought either. And that brings us to the, what I think is the real issue. Shall the courts measure property ownership, adverse possession, acquiescence, 
on someone's state of mind, on their knowledge? Or shall they measure it on their conduct, the things that actually can be measured? You can measure that Keith Elliott paid the property taxes for 16 years. You can measure that Keith Elliott rented out part of this five acre tract and let his neighbor farm it. You can measure that he got money for that and he didn't share it with Polly Ruland or anybody else. And the measurable actions. But you can also you can measure. measure that Keith Elliott executed a legal document to transfer his interest to someone else and recorded it uh, uh, to show the public that he did not own it. You're correct. That's, that's the problem for you. And I'll read from Freeman versus Funk. The evidence is abundant that the grantor all along asserted ownership in, in himself, as he already suggested numerous, as was suggested by numerous statements made by the grantee, and as testified by various persons. This amounted to repeated concessions that the grantor's claim was rightful and that the shifting of paper evidence of title back to the real owner was a mere formality. The courts dealt with the exact same situation. And I, I made a couple of mistakes there in reading that paragraph. I'm, I'm confident that the court will read it over. It's exactly the same situation. Thank you for your attention. Do we have any more questions? Thank you, counsel. We thank you all for your arguments this morning. The court will take this matter under advisement.